Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining. Um, welcome to the fight against illicit trafficking of firearms in Latin America and the Caribbean, a non-CLE webinar organized by the ABA Criminal Justice Section's International Committee in cooperation with the Caribbean Policy Consortium. So thank you so much everyone for joining and thank you in advance to our wonderful panelists and moderator for their time today. Before we start the program, I'm gonna share some housekeeping information. Uh, first, this is not a CLE accredited program. So just wanna make sure everyone's aware of that. And then second, you may submit questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll have time at the end um, after the panelists kind of overall presentations to answer questions and have more of a discussion. So uh, for all our listeners, if you um, see a, if you come up with a question, you know, just put it in that Q&A box and we'll try to get to it at the end. And then finally, this program is being recorded. So just want to make sure everyone knows that as well. Um, and I'm going to introduce today's moderator and then turn things over to get the program started. So our moderator today is Bruce Agaris. Bruce is a partner with the law firm of Berliner, Corcoran, and Rowe LLP in Washington, DC. His criminal work has included counseling businesses on anti-corruption and anti-money laundering and preparing due, dil due diligence programs. He regularly testifies as an expert in international criminal cases involving evidence gathering, extradition, prisoner transfers, money laundering, and tax crimes, and counseling of witnesses for grand jury investigations. Since 1985, he has edited the International Enforcement Law Reporter, and he's also been an adjunct professor of law at several law schools and has edited and authored several books, including ones on international white collar crime, cases and materials, and international criminal law, and as well as hundreds of articles on international law. And he's also a co-chair of the Criminal Justice Section's International Committee, and we're so grateful for his leadership within the Criminal Justice Section. And additionally, Bruce is a fellow with the Caribbean Policy Consortium. So again, thanks so much for joining and I'll turn it over to the moderator. Well, thank you very much, Kristen, for that generous introduction and also for all your help in um, organizing uh, the program. Uh, so I'm just gonna say a few words of introduction, then I'm going to um, introduce the speakers uh, so I can turn the program over to them. Um, the Americas, have had the highest regional homicide rate in the world with 17.2 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants, the global rate being 6.2 per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, and approximately 75% of the homicides are committed with firearms, um, indicating the, avail the availability uh, and easy access to some of them uh, that contribute to high levels of armed violence in the region, and also a lot of the uh, proliferation of firearms is connected to organized crime. Um, so this webinar then will discuss efforts to combat illicit trafficking of firearms in Latin America and the Caribbean, focusing on the Inter-American Convention Against Illicit Manufacture and Trafficking in Firearms, Ammunition, Explosives, and Other Related Materials, which uh, uses the acronym SIFTA. Uh, we'll also talk about the protocol against the illicit manufacturing and trafficking in firearms, uh, their parts and components and ammunition, which is um, often referred to as the firearms uh, protocol to the Palermo Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. Um, we'll also hear about um, what the uh, Caribbean, uh, especially CARICOM and IMPACTS is doing. And we'll hear about uh, the lawsuit pending in the US District Court in Massachusetts brought by the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Relations against gun manufacturers and distributors. So leading us off is going to be um, Ms. Simonetta Grassi, who's the chief of the firearms trafficking section of the United Nations Office uh, on Drugs and, um, and Crime, known, known by its acronym UNODC um, in Vienna. Um, uh, she's with um, the Organized Crime and Illicit Trafficking Branch, Division of Treaty Affairs since April 1 of this year. 
Uh, prior to that, she was the head of Global Firearms Program, um, which was established in 2011 to assist member states in their efforts to counter illicit manufacturing of and trafficking in firearms and their links to other serious uh, crimes. Um, as substance matter officer uh, for the firearms protocol, Ms. Grassi is also providing secretariat functions to the conference of the parties to the organized crime convention and its working group on firearms. Uh, Ms. Grassi joined the UN in uh, 1996 and held uh, several positions both at headquarters and in the field, um, including she was the uh, UNODC deputy representative in Colombia and in the Caribbean regional office in Barbados, uh, dealing with a, ver a varied uh, program portfolio on drugs and crime. Uh, prior to joining the UN, Ms. Grassi worked as a defense lawyer in Italy and as a researcher in criminal law and criminology in the beautiful walled um, University of Urbino. Um, she's been a scholar at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich and also at the Max Planck Institute for Criminal and Comparative Law in Freiburg, Germany. She holds a master's degree um, in law and a post-university degree in international relations in diplomacy uh, from the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna. Uh, she's going to be followed by Pierre Angeli De Luca Maciel. Uh, Pierre is a specialist in the Department of Public Security at the OAS. She's a Brazilian lawyer, graduated from USPE, um, University of Sao Paulo, uh, and has a master's in criminology uh, from the University of Ottawa. Um, she joined uh, the OAS Department of Public Security in 2015 and has coordinated projects focusing on criminal justice reform and firearms control. She currently supports the implementation of the program of assistance on control of arms and munitions, particularly providing legislative assistance to countries and leading the development of the regional communication mechanism on licit transfers of firearms and ammunition. Uh, she'll be followed by Sheridan Hill. Uh, Sheridan is the public information officer for the Criminal Investigations Department and Criminal Records Office at Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Corporate Communication Unit um, of the Trinidad Police Service. Um, he has uh, he's been an established professional with 33 years experience in the field of law enforcement, law, Caribbean security, terrorism, research on gangs, private security, crime and violence, Caribbean security issues, um, with a strong background on international policy coordination of the UN Security Council Resolution 1540, which deals with uh, preventing nuclear chemical or biological weapons uh, 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 distribution. Uh, he also um, has worked across four sectors, state, international organizations, academia, and private industry. Um, he also was a specialist uh, on Caribbean security at the OAS uh, during 2005 to 2011. And then batting cleanup is Alejandro uh, Solerio Alicantra. He is the legal advisor um, with the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Mexico. Um, he's been doing that since 2019, before he was the deputy legal um, advisor. Um, before that, he was the head of the section of Hispanic and Migration Affairs um, at the Embassy of Mexico. Um, here, and he was also counselor coordinator at the Embassy of Mexico. He has too many degrees to go through them all. Um, he, they include a law degree, uh, uh, a degree in public administration, an MA in sociology of the law. He's got a couple of LLMs from US universities, including 
University of San Francisco and University of Houston. So let me now um, turn the program over to Simonetta Grazi in Vienna. Simonetta. Yes, hi. And she's Should going to like she's going to uh, try to share her screen. Yes. Please let me know if you can see it. Can you see it? Not yet. Um, yes, we can see it now. Very clear. Okay, give me just a second to change to the presentation mode. Oops, no, one second. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Can you see it, right? Yes. Okay. So, thank you very much for inviting um, me in representation of, of my organization. As you mentioned, I work for the United Nations Office on, on Drugs and Crime. Uh, and in particular, I'm the um, section, the chief of the firearms trafficking section. It is actually a relatively new section because before we were under the organized crime section. So we are part of the organized crime branch, but as a section, we are relatively new. Um, I, since I am the first one to speak, um, I, I would just like to divide, um, say a few words about who we are and how we also see the, the problems of illicit trafficking in the region refer a little bit to the current political process in relation um, to this subject matter, and then go a little bit more into the actual relevance of the UN Firearms Protocol and its Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. I hope this is fine. So just a few words about, about us. As I said, um, UNODC is the Office on Drugs and Crime that has a, a long mandate and, and a long presence in Latin America and the Caribbean and works in, in many different fields related to drugs and crime. But in the area of firearms specifically, there is the Global Firearms Program that we established 10 years ago that aims at helping countries precisely responding, adopting effective measures, legal instruments, legal frameworks, but also operational practical measures to strengthen the criminal justice response. So we look at the problem of illicit firearms trafficking primarily through, through the angle of um, their, 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 their impact, I mean, the criminal law, the criminal dimension of, of this problem. I, I will not go much into what we do, I just show this slide to give you an idea of how we approach the issue. Um, we work in different areas with member states from providing legislative assistance to implement firearms protocol in the organized crime convention to more practical measures to actually help countries in establishing effective uh, regimes to prevent the illicit, the diversion, the trafficking of firearms through better measures like marking record keeping of weapons. And we also work a lot with criminal justice, with the criminal justice sector, meaning by that both law enforcement prosecutors, but also customs in the whole chain from detection, investigation, prosecution, adjudication of these crimes. And this, of course, involves an important component, which is international cooperation, and especially in criminal matters, because we speak of an offense that is transnational in, in nature. So this is really a very important component of, of our work. But another one, last but not least one, is also the promotion of a better understanding on the phenomenon through data collection and analysis. And I want to start by this, just by giving a little bit some, some insights from what UNODC has been researching, I mean, over in relation to, to this subject matter. And as you, Bruce, just mentioned clearly, and I think this is not, um, I'm not saying anything new when I say that um, according to UNODC's global homicide study, um, it found that uh, around half of all the homicides globally are committed with a firearm. And this statistic is particularly high in, in, in the American region, continent, where the numbers are way higher with two out of three victims 
of homicides, meaning about 75% of the victims shot with a gun. As you mentioned, you can see on the screen the, the regional differences and, and you clearly see how relevant the, the problem is in, in this region. Um, the, the study also concluded, for example, that it is usually the same countries that report not only the largest share of homicides related to organized crime and gangs, but also the largest share of male victims, the largest share of firearms homicide, and most of them located in, as I said, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, also, you know, this produces also the annual World Drug Report, and in its report in, already in 2016, it found that, of course, violence resulting from market disputes among drug trafficking organizations um, also were particularly little because they involved firearms. So it is obvious that firearms play a pivotal role in, in the genesis and the perpetration of violence in, in the region. Um, if we want to ask ourselves where these arms comes from, of course, based on our the global firearm study that we published in 2020, um, many uh, different a large variety of sources were identified, but primarily a large and very um, important flows, of course, of, of the illicit flows come from, sorry, are between within the American region, between um, from North America to Central America and South America, and to some extent also to, to the Caribbean. Um, as you can see, the, the prevalent mechanism for this trafficking, as we have seen it in from, from the findings of our study, it remains the armed trade on the one hand, so meaning the, the, the trafficking of small quantities from, of firearms across border, but in repeated and repeated um, numbers that in the end become an important amount. Um, and these arms are often also purchased through straw purchases. Um, and it's interesting because several high level straw purchases cases are also cited in Mexico's lawsuit. And I think Alejandro Celodio will maybe mention it. Um, and um, another emerging reality that has also been identified in the study is this problem of ghost guns that uh, not only in, in, in this region, but that make it particularly difficult to detect this type of, of trafficking. I, I just mentioned it to give a, a little framework and to show also the con in conclusion the fact that in Latin America and in the Caribbean, illicit firearms have a devastating impact on, on security and developing development as they are closely linked and exacerbate other forms of crime. Organized crime, but also drug trafficking, the, it, it accelerates, it increases the power of drug trafficking cartels. And therefore it is a, a problem that is per se, not only something that we have to look at in isolation, but also in connection with the impact that it has on on other forms of crime, in particular organized crime. And before coming to the protocol itself, I want to say a few words about the political process that is ongoing, because member states are, of course, very much aware globally that, um, that this is a problem and that uh, beyond the adoption of international instruments that have been adopted um, now 20 years ago, there is an ongoing push at the political level to for countries, for member states to do to do more about it. So, for example, um, uh, I, I will come to the instruments, the Organized Crime Convention and the protocol that I mentioned earlier. There is, they have a governmental, intergovernmental process that comes that accompanies this process, which is the conference of parties to the Organized Crime Convention. And for example, I just put on the screen some of the latest um, extracts from its resolution in 2020 which highlighted again the importance for states to strengthen also at domestic level some of the measures that are included in international instruments. And when I say international instruments, I don't mean only the firearms protocol. And my colleague Pierangela will, from the Organization of American States will also speak about the CIFTA convention. But basically there is a call also in the political uh, arena to really urge states to have stronger controls over um, the, the, the life cycle, the long, the, the entire life cycle of firearms in order to really make it more difficult for these arms to 
leave the legal circuit and enter the illicit uh, realm. So measures such as marking and record keeping, but also addressing the root causes of transnational organized crime in order to, to prevent and to address this problem in a, in a more comprehensive manner are part of the, of, of the efforts that are being pursued at, at, the, at the political level. And I want to mention also that very recently in, in April this year, no, sorry, in, in February this year, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs that is normally invested with drug trafficking with, with the world drug problem also adopted a very important resolution that acknowledged that um, illicit firearms trafficking is also deeply rooted and connected to other forms of crime, in particular drug trafficking, um, and acknowledge that, for example, drug traffickers are heavily arming themselves with uh, firearms that are often illicitly trafficked. And it also recognized that um, there are multiple links between these forms of crime, and therefore it is important to address this problem in, in a more integrated manner. And I want to mention this because this is a way also to, to acknowledge the relevance of these international instruments that exist, that continue to exist, and that continue to be relevant for the purpose of, of preventing and doing something about this problem. Now, when we speak about the international instruments, I mentioned before, there is not only the firearms protocol, but of course, there are various instruments that are extremely important. And I want to mention by it, the, first of all, the Organized Crime Convention, and its protocols, uh, and I have put it there. Also. Sorry. Sorry, before you continue, um, I wondered if you would want to fix your presentation mode to focus on the current slide, because right now we can see next slide too. Oh, you do. Oh, how do I do that? <laughs> Let me try. I'm wondering. Um, might I just be stop share and reshare. I'm sorry. Yeah. You've got um, great graphics, so I want want the participants yeah, to I, I, I wish, let me try if this is better uh, i'm really not suggested good. display settings is it better no no nope it's the same go um try up at the top the display settings tab the display one second i'm just sorry for that i'm really bad with technology um <laughs> Simonetta, I think you have to share the screen and then go up on the top. There is display settings, but while you're sharing, so you have to activate the sharing. It's usually because you have two screens. That's why it gives this okay, weird. So what mode. do I do? Sorry, just again, I share the screen number. So share the screen. Like now, now share the screen as it did before. Okay, one second. Yes. And then what you put on present this, you say display settings there on the bottom, like close to where you, you click on the presentation mode. Like at the bottom mm -hmm. of the PowerPoint, there is display settings. Yeah, now to the left, close there. Um, well, yeah, you can do that as well. Is that so now, uh, yeah, so now, now up there, up there, do you see display settings? Like for us, it, show, it shows, um, like upper there, really at the oh, top. Oh yeah. yeah, display settings. This, what do I push? Swap present and no, I'll duplicate. I think you have you have to push swap presenter view. I think the first one. Oops. Mm. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It okay? It worked. Looks yeah. good. Now it's okay, just on now, the current slide. Now I have two screens with exactly the same. It's fine, but as long as you see it well. It's fine. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no. Thank it's you. good that you mention it because that's the aim of the presentation. So, what I wanted to say, just to not to take so much of the time from the others, there are relevant instruments. The Organized Crime Convention is one that addresses, as I said, the, the problem of transnational organized crime. There are other instruments that make reference to the illicit trafficking of of firearms, and then there are different instruments in the field of. Uh, specifically relating to, um, I don't know if you see the full screen because I see my picture here and I cannot change it. 
Okay. Um, specifically relating to um, firearms, which are the firearms protocol, but also other instruments like, like the Arms Trade Treaty, the Program of Action. I'm only referring now to the international instruments. Um, but at policy level, at political level, also the Security Council has been invested often on, on, on these issues, especially on the linkages between, for example, terrorist acquiring weapons, but also on the linkages to organized crime. On this screen, what you can see is the Firearms Protocol. The Firearms Protocol is the, is the first global instrument that has been adopted to address the problem of illicit firearms. It's not the first one because the very first instrument was the SIFTA convention that was adopted in 1997, and I will not speak about it, but the protocol builds on the SIFTA convention. And um, what is important about the protocol is not only the fact that it um, is a global instrument and that is legally binding, but that it is intimately linked to the convention against transnational organized crime, meaning that the two instruments together provide a framework for states to um, prevent, but also counter the problem of illicit manufacturing, illicit trafficking in firearms. What you see on the screen is the current status of accession or ratification. And you see in, in the Americas, um, many, many countries have accept a, a, a party to it. Not all, you see um, a few ones are in, in, um, in yellow. Um, and in light pink are the signatories like Canada, for example. But um, what is important about this instrument, about the protocol, I mentioned already the, the political process of the Convention of the Parties, is the interaction between the Convention and the Firearms Protocol in the sense that the Convention lays down the foundations for states to counter the problem of transnational organized crime through measures that are then also applicable to specific situations of illicit trafficking, illicit manufacturing of firearms, which are offenses that fall under the firearms protocol. But in addition to the firearms, to these offenses, the firearms protocol establishes also a framework for preventive measures to, as I said earlier, to prevent, uh, to, to ensure that countries have the means and the measures in place to have a, 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 an adequate control to increase the traceability, the, the, the control over these firearms through marking, unique marking, uh, record keeping, transfer authorization systems, but also through measures that would enhance the cooperation among states. Because as I said earlier, when we speak of illicit trafficking, we speak of an offense that is transnational. It implies uh, a movement that crosses borders. What you see now on the screen is the definition that the protocol provides. And that's also important because it provides an internationally agreed definition on the term. Now, trafficking in this sense is the movement across borders, meaning that it does not specifically refer to the domestic trafficking within the national territory, but some countries have also criminalized the domestic trafficking. However, for the purpose of, 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 of the protocol, which is the instrument that, that it's like the, the, the glue that brings together um, international consensus about this problem. This is the internationally agreed definition that um, includes, as you say, a whole range of, of actions from the import, the export, the sale, etc. It is quite a broad definition um, and that refers to basically non-authorized, non-declared movements of, or, or transfers across borders, but also such movement includes also firearms that are not marked according to the requirements of the protocol. I just mentioned here again, the offenses that are established, but they are established for state parties to transpose them into their national legislation. And what you see, there are complementary measures. You, you see trafficking offenses, offenses related to firearms, but also offenses that are in the organized crime convention that are very relevant for the purpose of addressing this problem, like participation in an organized criminal group, laundering of proceeds of crime. We should never forget that every illicit trafficking flow includes often also illicit financial flows, and therefore these connections are very important. But there are also other synergies that exist with other instruments that I showed before on the screen, like the Arms Trade Treaty, because um, 
the, the finance protocol includes measures that uh, 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 require states to have a, um, a system in place for licensing or authorization for the import, the export, or the transit, right? But what, for example, the arms trade treaty provides in addition to the protocol, and uh, which I think is a very good complement, is that it introduces also assessment criteria. It requires the parties to the, to the ATT, for example, to assess before exporting the firearms or ammunition, whether um, the firearms in particular could be used to commit or facilitate an act constituting an offense under international conventions or protocols relating to transnational organized crime. So in a way, there is a connection between the arms trade treaty and the firearms protocol. Now, I mentioned these instruments because they are connected to each other and complementary, but it is also very important to notice and I just want to be very clear about it, that, um, that implementation, effective implementation of these instruments rests and depend on uh, national domestic um, transposition, meaning that um, it, is, um, it, is state, it depends on the states to the extent to which the states in transpose these measures into their domestic legislation and jurisprudence. But nevertheless, the existence of instruments like the firearms protocol, the organized crime convention together, or the arms trade treaty, um, provide a solid groundwork for states to create such offenses in the first place, but also to create measures um, uh, to introduce offenses and, and criminal law provisions that will help national criminal justice uh, systems to, to effectively combat every forms or most of these forms, for example, I spoke about the armed trafficking. Well, the, 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 the definition of illicit trafficking would allow to cover this, as well as the, when we speak of straw purchases, um, the offenses included in the protocol also require state parties to criminalize the act of aiding, abetting, facilitating these offenses. So it could be argued that also aiding uh, the illicit trafficking could be committed through, through facilitating straw purchases. Um, and also the, the, the knowledge or the intention is, is of course relevant for the purposes of um, understanding what or if there are criminal offenses that could be applied at the domestic level. So the international instruments, although not directly um, enforceable, uh, they have to go through domestic criminal law. They do provide a relevant um, background, I would say, for, for the purposes of dealing with these offenses. And I, I would stop here because I see that I'm taking a lot of time, but I just wanted to give this, this overview of the instruments and also how they can be relevant both for, the, for addressing this problem of illicit trafficking among states. I also forgot to mention that one essential um, advantage of the protocol that com comes, that complements the Organized Crime Convention is that because we speak of a transnational offense, states can use the organized crime convention also as the legal basis for the purpose of cooperating among them in criminal matters. So this is basically the, the context in which states can operate in order to address the problem of illicit trafficking. Thank you very much. I stop here and go Thank back very to much. you. Thank you very much, Simonetta, for that great uh, introduction and overview. And I'm sure we're gonna come back to uh, a lot of what you said in the Q and A. Um, session. So let me turn the program now over to Pierre. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and I'll, to start, I wanted to thank for the, the invitation uh, on behalf of the Department of Public Security of the OAS. It's a great pleasure to be here and share a little bit of what we've been doing in terms of the CIFTA convention. And thank you, Simonetta, for introducing the convention and giving me uh, all the framework for my presentation now. Um, can you see it on presentation mode? Yes. Okay, That's perfect. Fine. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna try to avoid repeating a lot of uh, what's been said. As, as Simonetta mentioned, uh, CIFTA was the, the first legally binding agreement 
Um, of course, it's a regional convention. Uh, it focused on all the countries in the Americas, North America, Latin America, Caribbean. Uh, it was signed in 1997, um, and we have a great level of adhesion to this convention, which gives a lot of weight and strength uh, to be the main framework to address the issue of illicit trafficking in the Americas. Um, 31 out of the 34 OAS member states have ratified CIFTA, so they have a legal obligation to comply with the convention. Uh, and then three other countries, uh, the three remaining countries of the region have signed it. Um, so CIFTA, uh, as Simonetta well said, um, it was the base for the UN firearms protocol. So it's very similar to these other international instruments that were mentioned by her. Uh, in terms of the main obligations, the countries have committed uh, to establish jurisdiction over criminal offenses, particularly the, the, the offense of the illicit manufacturing and the illicit trafficking of firearms. Uh, there are some specific offenses that uh, derive from those. So for instance, also to um, sell a firearm um, without a proper marking on it, that would be considered illicit manufacturing. Uh, and that's very key since uh, marking is essential for us to be able to trace this, the firearms and be able to identify where are the vulnerabilities and the gaps that lead to diversion to the illicit uh, market. So it also mandates the marking of firearms, uh, record keeping, uh, strengthening physical security and stockpile management practices. This is very key in the region. It's one of the main things. Some of the countries of the region, uh, we have some data that indicates that the illicit trafficking in itself is not the key problem in that specific country. In that specific country, most of the firearms were legally imported and then they were diverted once they after the legal importation. So they were diverted in the country. And that's usually because you don't have uh, uh, strong practices and, and processes to control the firearms, including points of vulnerability in the official and the institutional arsenal of uh, police forces and armed forces, that those, are, those firearms are diverted to the illicit market. Um, of course, improving border controls, this is a transnational issue, so countries have to cooperate um, to make uh, the borders more secure. Um, CIFTA also mandates the countries to have export, import, and transit licensing systems. That means that for the legal commerce of firearms, no countries that have signed CIFTA should allow any shipment of firearms if all the other countries involved in that process have not issued the corresponding licenses. So this is something that it's, uh, it complements kind of, or the ATT complements this base basis here because it's something very simple on CIFTA and the ATT will go way more details than this obligation, but this is the basis for it. Um, and then of course, countries should cooperate and exchange information and experience. So to implement CIFTA, um, the convention has uh, more than 20 years. So we do have a very well-established structure. Uh, politically, uh, CIFTA is the key document uh, to join all the countries in the region to discuss what are their strategies and their priorities. Uh, we have the Conference of State Parties as the highest level uh, in the hierarchy of CIFTA. And then we have a consultative committee uh, that meets annually and the consultative committee has, has points of contact and that's very important more on a technical level so countries can cooperate. Uh, then of course we have the Secretariat Pro Tempore and uh, luckily uh, we have the government of Mexico taking the lead on it uh, for the past five years they have leading the CIFTA meetings um, and really assisting us and making a very integrative work to call attention to this problem. Um, and then the technical secretariat, that's basically where we work at the OAS um, as the implementing body to support the work of the state parties. So we assist them in implementing the convention. We have two departments that are responsible for the code, tech, code technical secretariat. So uh, the Department of Public Security, where I'm working, where I'm going to continue presenting, and the Department Against Transnational Organized Crime. We both help the countries uh, to target this issue. And essentially at the DPS, what we work is to better control the life cycle of the firearms since it's manufactured until the point of destruction. So we support the better control of the life cycle uh, to avoid diversion. 
we also work to prevent risk factors that are associated with more engagement with armed violence. So we work in a twofold approach. Uh, we have the control of the offer of firearms to limit access to it, and then also control and reduce the demand for firearms, pr promoting more uh, a culture of peace. Um, so as clear results and outcomes of this CIFTA process, we have the course of action that is in place. In the course of action is the document that is approved by the state parties, um, where they detail what are going to be their priorities in the course for the next few years, considering the general obligations of CIFTA. We also established a CIFTA voluntary trust fund that countries have created to support implementation. Uh, we have a series of model legislation to support the countries in implementing the convention. So the idea is to facilitate that the countries can harmonize their domestic legislation to the standards of CIFTA. And then of course, the more operational aspects that it would be producing data about the topic with the mandate to do a illicit study uh, or a, a study on illicit trafficking of firearms in the region. And our program, the program of assistance and control of arms and ammunition that work with the countries. I will try to go through this very quickly and then the presentation can be shared with everyone uh, because I don't wanna take a lot of the time. So for the model legislation, as I mentioned, we do have seven model laws, each one for one of the key aspects and the obligations of CIFTA. And the goal is for the countries to have a document where they can have that guide to easily uh, implement domestic legislation that is aligned with those obligations and facilitate uh, um, facilitating uh, the, the, the convention being applied in their own countries. Uh, we also have some guidelines and menus. All these have been created and approved by their own state parties. So it has the political support, which is very important as well. Um, for the study of the illicit firearms trafficking, countries have determined um, that we have to improve the knowledge in the region, um, considering that uh, there is still many gaps and we have four mandates of the General Assembly mandating to do that study. Uh, we do have the global study of firearms. Uh, the global study is our reference right now, uh, but unfortunately, because of many challenges, including the own capacity of the countries to produce data, uh, the idea is for us to be able to focus more on the region and the specificities of the region in this study. And we hope that we can do that together with UNODC so uh, we don't have double work and we can already take uh, all the knowledge that UNODC has consolidated on data production. Um, so the objectives of the study is really to assess the, understand the patterns of the illicit trafficking in the region, but then also assess the institutional capacities to control, investigate, and persecute the illicit firearms trafficking. The idea is to be able to uh, give the countries a parameter where they can see uh, where are they standing considering the region and where they need to go from there. Uh, what are the key recommendations? that they have to follow so they can improve the control and uh, address the illicit firearms trafficking. And all of that considering that a very real human impact that firearms trafficking has in the region, as we've heard with uh, the high levels of homicide rates and the gender perspective, understanding that it affects women and men in very different way and also other groups in situation of vulnerability. And uh, complementary to all of that, uh, we also have our program of assistance for control of arms and munition. Uh, this program uh, has was started in 2007, providing more uh, technical assistance to countries to operationally um, control the firearm cycle. So we've worked a lot with marking, training, and destruction of firearms, firearms that were seized. And a lot of times the firearms are seized and there is no capacity to properly destroy it. And that poses a risk since they stay uh, in institutional storages that are not appropriate uh, to store the firearms uh, safely. Um, so we've worked in a first phase in more than 25 countries, donating machines, marking the firearms, uh, also destroying more than 60,000 firearms. So we reduced the circulation of firearms. And uh, in 2019, we started a new phase of this project with funding from the European Union, and we are currently implementing it. And that new phase has more of the legislative assistance component, uh, in addition to all of the other work that we were doing. And they also focus a lot on regional coordination. 
Um, so in terms of legislative assistance, we uh, offer to the countries that want uh, a technical review, a detailed analysis of their firearms normative framework. Um, so that includes the Firearms Act for the countries that have it, the penal code, uh, and all the other legislation that is connected with this issue. Sometimes it's, it's exporting, importing control. So we do that comprehensive review and uh, we present to the countries an analysis of what needs to be strengthened, considering the SIFTA convention, which is our key parameter, but we also uh, take into consideration the firearms protocol, the ATT, if the country has ratified the ATT. So we try to complement with all the international agreements existing. And we've worked so far with Peru, Ecuador, El Salvador, Panama, and Jamaica on this reviewing process. And then uh, sometimes depending on the needs of the countries, there is no like one size fits all approach. We work with each country uh, to determine what are their needs. If we have to assist them drafting a new firearms act, or if we have to make suggestions or work with them in the legislative branch to get the firearms approved or the new act approved. Um, so in terms of results for this past three years, we've worked with 22 countries in the past three years. Uh, five countries have received, received the legislative assistance. Um, and then we have all these other components, uh, capacity building, more than a thousand personnel was trained. Uh, we donated marking machines to 10 countries. We've destroyed uh, more than 37 tons of ammunition and 34,000 uh, firearms. We also improved uh, the security conditions of the uh, storages of the, for the institutional um, capacities. And we've worked to prevent armed violence, working with at-risk youth in Honduras and the community leaders doing training for them as well. And um, as, as Bruce mentioned when he was presenting me, we are also working on developing this regional communication mechanism on the listed transfers of firearms and ammunition. So there is the Article 9 of CIFTA that has that specific uh, obligation for the countries to control the listed commerce. And the goal here is to be able to close some of these gaps and vulnerabilities in the legal commerce of firearms. Um, so we can avoid diversion to the illicit trafficking. So the MCTA would be able to facilitate the direct communication uh, between the licensing authorities. So they can um, risk, they can alert each other about risks. They can exchange the information of the license. They can make some sort of validation and verification process. Uh, so this is a very, the goal is to be a very easy tool to use, but it's a very complex process to develop since there are privacy laws that uh, hinder sharing information, we would have to have agreements with each country. So we are working on this very expensive reviewing process that we are developing this with the countries. We have 20 countries participating in the reviewing committees and we are developing this framework with them. And we hope next year, we're gonna have the final design to program the electronic solution. Uh, and I'm gonna close now, but just to say that we have a new phase of this project approved by the European Union. It will start right after this phase ends. So we hope that we will continue working with the countries until 2025 at least. Uh, with that approach of anchoring everything on our legal assistance and working with that twofold approach of the control of the offer and the prevention for the demand. And we are also including here a component to develop a Central American firearms roadmap based on the good experiences that we had first in the Western Balkans with the UN agencies working there. And then also we in the Caribbean where CARICON impacts uh, and UN LERIC have led the development of the firearms roadmap as a tool for the countries to cooperate in an easier way. So I know that I've said a lot and I don't wanna take more time and I hope we can have a good discussion um, in the Q&A and answer specific questions. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pierre, for that great presentation. You covered a lot of ground and you gave a perfect transition talking about the attempt for the Central American road firearms roadmap to Sheridan. I think he's gonna mention the Caribbean a firearms roadmap. So Sheridan, take it away. You're on mute though.
So at the bottom left of your screen. Right. Yep. Right. Okay, now let me see. Yep, yeah, we're seeing that fine. Okay, so you're seeing me clear, right? Yep. Okay, so a lot of what Piera and Simonetta mentioned. Uh, Sheridan, before you start, just uh, make the slides bigger, I think, because okay. we're, we're kind of seeing three in a row right now. I am in a little bit of a pickle like Simonetta. Uh, so let me see if I can come out of this and, and get back. Oh, just a minute. No. Oh, um, Kristen, could you uh, work the, the slides yeah. for me? I'm having some. Yeah, some do you want me to try? I'll, yeah, I'll try pulling it up. Okay. Okay, you go through this slide. Yes, next slide. So uh, based on what Simonetta and Pierre did, I, I hope I don't repeat too much of what was said. I'll try not to. And my presentation will be more from a, 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 a subject matter expert, more practitioner's perspective, but also a bit of what CARICOM is doing and what Trinidad and Tobago is doing both as a regional security leader and also what we're doing here on the issue of, of, of traf illicit trafficking and fans in the Caribbean. So I'll touch a little bit on the Caribbean or vulnerabilities, the, the impact of, of, uh, of uh, the, the crime situation, the involvement of uh, the, or the impact of firearms on, on, on crime in the Caribbean, a little bit about the, our trafficking issues domestically and what we've done, how we've responded to the issue at the global hemispheric, regional, and national level. And then I'll probably make some, some concluding remarks. Next slide. So while, while I know it's not, it's not a class I'm lecturing to, it's always important for people to understand when we speak of the Caribbean, depending on which definition of the Caribbean you use, you, 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 you get very different outcomes. So if we talk about the ACS, much of those Latin American countries are member states of the, the ACS. And then if you, if you think of the CARICOM definition of, of the Caribbean, it's those member states of those, those, those OAS member states plus one non-independent country. A lot of people don't realize that there's one non-independent member state of CARICOM. And then we have the Commonwealth Caribbean, which, which is a little less, and then you can get into the independent, non-independent countries. But at this stage, I think it's important to understand that Trinidad Tobago has the lead responsibility for crime and security in the region. And as firearms, is a, is a serious concern to us. We've done quite a bit on the issue of, of crime and security, but in particular on the issue of illicit trafficking and firearms in the region. Next slide. All right, so as a region, we are vulnerable. We are vulnerable because of a location between the, not just the drug, consume, drug producing countries in the, in the, in the, in the South and the, the consuming countries in North America and, and Europe. We also have, and I'll mention it a little later on, we also have a number of firearms producing countries in, in, in Latin America and as well as our, our big, our big neighbor further up north, up north. So we are, we are also in hurricane belt, so we're very vulnerable. And we're also in the US back door. So you, you, I'm sure most of you have heard of the, being in the, being the, the, the US third border. Uh, and, and also we, we also, yeah, but yeah, so we, we, we consider at times the third border and we're in the US sphere of influence. So we generally are small, Caribbean countries are small when compared to our, our Latin American and North American neighbors, only Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago has more than 1 million people. 
Um, we're multiple island states, and that provides a challenge for us to, 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 to secure, to patrol our borders. Because the, for us, we're, as we're multiple island states, you, what you find is that for us, we, we don't have much land, land border issues, but we have to patrol the coast, and which is where most of our drugs and firearms come in. And then when you think of countries like Belize and, and Guyana, as I mentioned before, we're small, but if you think of Belize and Guyana, two of the few countries that are, that are landlocked, those countries are very small populations. Guyana is 83,000 square miles, as opposed to Trinidad, which is less than 2,000 square miles. But the population of Guyana is just around 750,000, whereas Trinidad and Tobago is 1.4 million. Jamaica is 2.6. So when you think of the, of the, the, num the population of the country, and the size of the country, the challenge where those, where those people live, and the challenge of the state to, to really police their borders, and the issue of the inflow of not just drugs and people, but also of firearms. Uh, and, we, and, and as we're small, we're challenged, the economies are challenged, so securities are costly undertaken. I spent a number of years in Washington. So I, I, I understand the issues, the cost of security. So as we're small and our economies are challenged and we're, we're monocrop societies, the issue of providing adequate security for us becomes, becomes a, a, a larger problem. But for us, our main concern really, we, 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 to a large extent, we don't have traditional border security issues. So crime is a critical issue for all of us in the Caribbean. Next slide, please. All right. So that UN OEC 2007 World Bank study found that you know, the, the, the region had a, one, of, one of the highest levels of crime in the world because we had one of the highest murder rates and we led our Mongol leaders on various categories of serious crimes. And then UNDP, 2012 later on spoke about the impact that those crimes are having on our small fragile economies. So really in the Caribbean today, you have a high number of murders, gang violence is on, on the rise. We have a high number of woundings and shootings, kidnappings for randoms, for ransom. And you have a, a high number of multiple murders in countries like Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, and some of the other countries. Trafficking and drugs people, and our topic today, firearm and ammunition, is a big concern for us in the region. Next slide, please. All right. So that UN OEC uh, World Bank study 2007 found, obviously I challenged that later on and others have challenged it, that we in that study, they found that the Caribbean had the highest, highest murder rate per capita of all the regions in the world at 30 murders for 100,000 people. If the study actually found that, that, that countries in the region had a higher, much higher murder, uh, people being killed by, um, because they were murdered as compared to countries with civil wars. Countries with civil wars had lower death rate than, that, than us in the region here. Four of the countries in a study, study that I did, four of the countries, the, the top four countries with the highest murder rates when you look at them, gang violence was the number one classification of those murders. So we have a gang violence problem in the Caribbean. And when you look at those murders, 80 to 86 percent, CARICOM is saying 80 to 86 percent of those murders are committed with the use of firearms, as well as the woundings, and again, if it's shooting, it's committed using a firearm. So firearm, illegal firearms, and sometimes illegal firearms as well, is of serious concern to us in the region. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. I think it's important to note that we in the Caribbean, I heard my two colleagues before uh, uh, speak at, at, at in great detail about the provisions of SIFTA and the Arms Trade Treaty. And then all the other conventions, which are the protocol to the Convention on Organized Crime and the Program of Action on, on Illicit Firearms and so on. But I think it's important to note that while we are, are, we are acutely affected by firearms, we don't produce firearms in the, in the 
CARICOM and Commonwealth Caribbean. If you use the ACS definition of the Caribbean, you, you, you'd find that a number of those countries, they produce firearms, but none of the CARICOM, OAS, and Commonwealth countries, Commonwealth Caribbean countries, produce firearms. I think it's important to know that whilst we are affected, we don't produce firearms. Next slide, please. All right. So how do the firearms come in? Uh, let's look at Trinidad and Tobago now. We, they, they come in through the legal ports and as well as the illegal ports. And you know, it's interesting, I was speaking to the, the, the head of the Coast Guard um, recently, and he said they have observed that since around 2017 to 2018, that while there's this belief it's, it's out there in the literature and most of the studies you see, the drugs accompany the arms and the, and the, 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 the firearms accompany the drugs and the firearms accompany the people. They have found that from most of their interdiction operations, that that is not so. And what we found is that most of the firearm discoveries are coming through our legal ports. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we have two airports, one airport in Trinidad, which is Piaco, and another airport in Tobago, which is the Anna Robinson Airport. And, and while we have a number of legal ports in Trinidad, the, the, the ports where you have the container traffic, it's just that Port of Spain and that Point Lisas. And in Tobago, while you don't have container, container operations, you have pleasure crafts and containers being shipped to Tobago through the Scarborough port. So those are the, the legal ports of concern. And for us, for us in Trinidad and Tobago, just like our Caribbean neighbors, the issue, as was mentioned by my two previous speakers, the issue is one of border security for us. And sometimes people wonder why you, you, you speak about the, 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 the characteristics and the description of Caribbean countries. We're small, we're multiple island states, we have all these challenges, so it's extremely difficult. Take, for example, a country like St. Kitts and Nevis. St. Kitts and Nevis is fifth, fifth, about 58,000 people. Think of that country. And the other thing is most of the, our Eastern Caribbean countries, they do not have militaries. So think of the challenges of Caribbean countries to secure their borders, to secure their 12, mile, their, their 12 miles, uh, territorial sea and their 200 miles exclusive economic zone. So think of what is happening in those countries. Take, for example, a country like Bahamas, multiple islands with a small population. So the demands on those countries to secure their, their, their borders is amazing. It's truly amazing. Next slide. So just to give you a sense as to some of the, the, the firearms that we, the, the origins. Now, remember a short while ago, I, I mentioned that we don't produce firearms in Trinidad and Tobago or anywhere in the CARICOM Caribbean, Commonwealth Caribbean, or the OAS Caribbean member states. This is where most of, of the firearms that we, we have, have, have seized in this country have come from, and you can see clearly from the data, the United States of America is the, the, the major source of the firearms entering into the country. And you also see quite a significant number of firearms coming from one of our Latin American, uh, uh, coming from one of our Latin American neighbors, which is Brazil and, and Italy, Australia, and the other, the other um, European country provides the bulk, is the source of the bulk of the firearms coming into our country. Next slide. All right, so how have we responded as a country to the issue of illicit trafficking in firearms? Now, as a, as a regional security leader, within CARICOM, you have a quasi-cabinet quasi because we're small and we challenge and we're facing all these vulnerabilities, particularly with respect to cap capacity constraints and finance. It's important for us to come together as a region and where, where our responses will be regional and those regional responses will assist the weaker states in, in, in the region. So for the arms trade treaty, which, which the, the Caribbean had a particular interest in, this country 
provided the lead negotiator on the arms trade treaty, which is Ambassador Eden Charles. He was the lead negotiator for CARICOM. And I'm happy to say that we got the inclusion of small arms and light weapons, much to the chagrin of other countries, as well as Article 5 and 6, all those controls that were mentioned earlier on by Simonetta and Piera. The, the issue of accountability, uh, records, points of contact in the country, the important issue of, 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 of transit firearms coming to the country. We fought for those, those articles to be included in the treaty. So we played a major role in the arms um, trade treaty, and we also provided the lead negotiator. We're very active in the in the, the program of action on, on illicit firearms and the, as well as the protocol. In fact, the, I'm happy to say that, uh, well, as you all know, I am a servant police officer and the special investigations unit is the, the agency that is the point of contact for the UN protocol on firearms. And as I'm speaking about, about, about uh, responses, I know my two previous colleagues spoke a lot on, on treaties. Um, the, we, we spoke a lot about SIFTA, uh, Trinidad and Tobago is a party to SIFTA, um, all Caribbean countries are parties, um, parties to SIFTA. In fact, um, and as Piera mentioned, the only country that is not, that has not ratified. And I, I actually did some work while I was there, uh, working closely with Lincoln Allen while I was in Washington, the Department of Public Security, working on those internal issues to bring Jamaica in line. I see you, you, you're continuing in that faith. So I am. Um, I I fully understand. I appreciate. You know, Sheridan, could you finish in in the next two minutes, just so that Alejandro will have time. Thank you. Sure. Next slide, please. All right. So at the, at the hemispheric level, all Caribbean countries have signed on to SIFTA. Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, even though we didn't sign on in, in ninety eight, we we signed in, in we didn't sign in ninety seven when the the, 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 um, the convention came into force. We are party to SIFTA. We participated in the. I was actually in, in DPS at the time when Trinidad and Tobago participated in the firearms marking project, as well as those stockpile management and so on. And a number of other Caribbean countries actually involved in that. Um, I must mention as well that you know that uh, Jamaica is the only Caribbean country that has not ratified, but it has signed on, and I'm sure my colleagues are working feverishly to comply with those and uh, ensure that those internal mechanisms are consistent with the with the um with 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 um with SIFTA. I think it's important to note that while we and it's something I did when I occupied that seat that Pierre is holding now. I, I remember working closely with Jamaica, nudging Jamaica, nudging Jamaica to, 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 to ratify. And it's important to note, we in the Caribbean, we small, we challenge, we face to be a vulnerable. And the, our two large North American partners have not ratified SIFTA. I think it, 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 it must not go unnoticed that while we get all these pressures from, from different quarters to sign, to ratify these, these treaties and to comply with all these obligations, our two large North American partners still have not ratified SIFTA. Next slide, please. So at the regional level, there's a new there's a new architecture for security. Trinidad and Tobago has the lead responsibility for crime and security. It's important, as I mentioned before, for us to collaborate and, and cooperate. My good friend Ivola Griffith always speaks about the collaboration imperative. And it's a, it, I mean, it, it, it's a no-brainer. We're small, we challenge, uh, we lack resources, we have capacity constraints. So countries like Trinidad take the lead. And we, we have implemented things like the, the radar system, CARICOM impacts is something that one of the previous leaders, Prime Minister Manning, pumped a lot of funds in, much to the criticisms of some of the, the, the people here. But the, the intention was, if we make the region safer, our countries like us and other neighboring countries would benefit. So we lead in many respects. We lead in terms of funding. We lead in terms of providing venues, because CARICOM Impacts is based here in Trinidad and Tobago. We lead in, in terms of staffing. We staff those agencies. We're also very active. We, we, we're the most active. Caribbean country in, in CICAD, in, in SICTE, and I'm sure in DPS as well. We hosted uh, a lot of those, those initiatives in, in, in from the Department of uh, Public Security. I remember we worked on the establishment of the Inter-American Observatory in the Americas. Uh, Sheridan, so that, Sheridan, um, sorry to cut you off, but uh, in order to leave enough time, 
Uh, we only have another um, 17 minutes left. I want to. Okay. Uh, we should um, now. So I'll close off in the next minute or two. So so we have um we have the de our declaration on fire. You know we have a treaty among our Caribbean countries. We have the declaration on on the Bastille Declaration at the national level. We we have, we've acquired long range K class and stand patrol patrol vessels that not only patrol our waters. We assist other Caribbean countries. We have electronic assets which assist not just this country all the way up the Eastern Caribbean, all the way up to up to Saint Lucia. Um, a lot of the stuff that was mentioned before, e trace training for for our police officers by UNA ODC, um, ATF. We actually in, 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 in um actually linked to the ATF database. We have new legislation on bail and the, and members of the judiciary are taking new approaches to, to bail for persons with firearm charges. We have a, a very robust community um, community engagement. So we really appeal to people in many different fora. If you see something, say something on firearms. Recently, our commissioner launched National Operation Task Force, and we actually we're going to implement your Air Corp and Sea Corp, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. That's the security cooperation, both at the airports and the seaport. Most of our, 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 our operations now are intelligence led. So we have our national um, SSA to get out the other in intelligence agency unit, and we work closely with CARICOM, the Joint Re Regional Command Center, and the Fujian Center. Next slide, please. Okay, I think, I think we have to. Um, stop there, Sheridan, because um, I really want to give Alejandro time. And you've got excellent slides that people are going to be able to also um, see afterwards. Um, so let's now, uh, before we run out of time completely, uh, turn it over to Alejandro and talk about the lawsuit. Thank you very much, Sheridan. Sorry to. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Sheridan. Thank you, Bruce, and uh, to the ABA Criminal Justice Section, and for all my co-panelists. I'll I'll build up um, build up on what Sheridan was uh, mentioning by by saying that it is clear that governments in the region and in the world are working hard, very hard. Um, international organizations are working very hard in trying to put a stop into the armed violence generated by the illicit trafficking of weapons into our countries. What is um, extremely important to highlight is that the majority of the countries that are affected by armed violence um, as a consequence of the illicit trafficking of guns, um, a good number of them military style weapons, uh, the assault rifles, um, have a very strict legislations forbidding, uh, prohibiting the legal trade of weapons, differently from what happens in some countries like the United States. Um, in Mexico, and I'll refer only to Mexico and then I'll talk more about the, the lawsuit. Um, in Mexico, we have only one office managed by our army, the Ministry of Defense, the Secretary of, of National Defense, um, administers this office where uh, private citizens can apply for a permit, and once they have the permit, they can buy certain weapons. Um, it's important to um, share that these weapons are not the kind of weapons that are sold in the United States. The caliber is very small. We're not talking about uh, the military style rifle, like a Barrett caliber 50, that you could buy as a private citizen in the United States. So what is that happens? Um, with Mexico and the United States. With such a broad border, uh, we have a constant traffic of illicit weapons from the United States into Mexico. Uh, what we argue in our lawsuit, and then I'll give some details about the lawsuit, is that Mexico suffered of an armed violence situation. This armed violence situation is generated um, by the number, the very high number of weapons and military style weapons in the order of half a million weapons trafficked from the United States every year. This is a conservative estimate, half a million weapons coming from the United States. Um, this number of weapons have um, increased in being trafficked since 2004, the year where the assault weapons bans ban expired in the United States. So there is a relation that we claim 
as uh, victims, the government of Mexico is suing as a victim. There is a relation between the increase on production and trade um, of weapons in the United States and homicides by firearm in Mexico. We're talking about tens of thousands of uh, people that are killed and a lot more are, that are hurt by firearms, by firearms that shouldn't exist in Mexico because in Mexico, we don't sell them. And if we import uh, legally weapons from the United States or other countries, there's a very strict mechanism to assess the risk of uh, the final use and final user of these weapons. But the matter, the, the fact is the reality is that there is a legal trade of weapons in the United States and through negligent and illicit actions of uh, gun manufacturers and gun distributors, these weapons are illicitly trafficked into Mexico through, um, and trafficking as Simoneta mentioned, um, um, straw purchasers, and other um, actions that are, are negligent. Why are they negligent? And you, somebody would say like, what is the fault of a legally established business into what happens in Mexico? Well, there's a matter of foreseeability. Sadly, everybody knows what happens in Mexico or we know somebody that knows what happens in Mexico. People don't want to travel to Mexico because it's dangerous. There's a, um, um, Department of State uh, travel alerts of, because of violence in Mexico, violence generated by these weapons that are trafficked. The gun manufacturers and the gun distributors are on notice. They know that these red flags, they know about this situation, they know that their weapons are used by criminals and criminal organizations in Mexico to commit crimes. And even though they know and they have known this for decades, they do nothing to remediate this. The government of Mexico, like a lot of uh, governments, and, and I say again, thank you to Sheridan because he's playing a lot of what we do in the binational forum, the multilateral forum, we're part of conventions, we prosecute the criminals, we put more forces and uh, distract a lot of our resources and taxpayers' money to protect our borders. But still, there's half a million weapons coming into uh, Mexico. The reality is that in the situation between Mexico and the United States, both governments work together. They work unilaterally. Uh, the US is doing a lot more now to, to stop the illegal export of um, legally bought firearms in the United States into Mexico. There's in the last year, there have been several um, cases of um, trafficking among US states and then trying to bring them down into Mexico. The most um, of the most impact, the most recent 3 million munitions were seized in Mexico and they were coming from Mexico, from the United States. This is 3 million. So even though as governments, we work together and we prosecute the criminals, these consumers in Mexico that shouldn't exist, nothing had been done to work with a missing link. What is the missing link in this equation? The corporations. We are asking through this litigation, the companies to be accountable, to be diligent, for them to be more careful in the way they conduct business. This lawsuit is not against the second amendment, is not against the US government, is not against um, US citizens that buy guns. This is a tort law civil lawsuit that we filed in federal court in Boston, Massachusetts. And we claim that these negligent actions by the defendants, the corporations were suing, actively facilitate the illicit traffic of their weapons into Mexico. How do we know this? Through the traceability of the serial numbers of their weapons. If the traceability information was public, and anybody could see it, we could see the river, the Iron River that flows from the United States into crime scenes in Mexico. I'm sure it happens also the, that river flows to other countries in the region. Um, with the time that I have, I just wanna highlight that one um, precedent. 
In March of 2000, President Bill Clinton at the White House then announced this very important and historical agreement with the Smith and Wesson. This is 2010. Sadly, Smith and Wesson didn't comply with it. And Smith and Wesson agreed to have controls in place to help keep guns out of the hands of criminals and help law enforcement crack down illegal gun traffickers. 2010, there is information out there. There's information in the public arena for the companies to know and be on notice that their products are being used to commit crimes. I was uh, listening to Simonetta when um, we talk about the ATT and the risk assessment in exportations. The companies that are selling to governments are very careful in how they sell and who do they sell to, to governments. But they should take the same care with their distributors, with the distributor chain. They know who are the bad apples and they do nothing to remedy this. Um, we're suing on their, um, the US legal system. We're suing in English. We're suing in a federal court in Massachusetts with all the respect we have to the US sovereignty and the US as a country and as a system. And we are um, relying on the judicial system to claim a harm that we're suffering as victim, a victim, the government of Mexico is suffering a direct and indirect harms. And that's why we're suing in US courts. Okay, so um, so that's the, you've concluded your presentation, Alejandro, huh? Yeah, I saw a, a chat here to finish 1225. Okay. Or 125, mm -hmm. go ahead. Okay. So we, we, we have a few more minutes um, for Q&A. So first, um, do any of the panelists have any um, questions or comments on uh, the, the presentations that we've heard so far? I, I would just like to make a comment of like what Pierre, Simonetta and Sheridan um, said. I believe, and this is for, for the audience and thank you for all of your attention. I think there's out there a framework available for our governments to do more to prevent illicit trafficking and armed violence. Um, Secretary of the Mexican Secretary of uh, Foreign Relations went before the UN Security Council and said, we have the opportunities as governments to encourage our corporations, our private sector, to do more to prevent violence through being more strict in the way we con that companies conduct their trade uh, of guns. So I see this as an opportunity and, and hope uh, the U.S. authorities see it as well. So, so in this regard, um, I've seen some comments that the OAS should solicit, if not require, the assistance of businesses and NGOs, and that they should consider adding a provision like Article 13 of the UN Protocol, which requires states to cooperate with industrial players um, and, and tries to get businesses to cooperate more. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I mean, how can we get businesses to, to, to do more? And I think, Simonetta, I, I see you've got your, your hand raised. Yes, thank you very much. You, you mentioned Article 13 of the protocol, but it's not just a reference to an article that I want to make. Um, I, I agree with Alejandro that while it is a state responsibility to, to fully implement and give effect to international commitments like the prevention and the combat of illicit trafficking or of transnational organized crime, cooperation with the private um, sector, but also with civil society is extremely important. Um, I give just one example, um, two examples. Um, when, when for me, you know, at, it, understanding this article of the protocol that says that state parties shall seek the cooperation of the manufacturer, doesn't mean only that the manufacturer suggests to the national um, delegations that go to international conferences, how for them the marking should be done, what is feasible, what is not feasible. This is a very narrow interpretation. The private industry or the manufacturing industry 
can have a much larger role in, in preventing the diversion, in facilitating the tracing, and also the investigation when it comes, when, when illicit weapons are, or when the information about diversion or trafficking uh, comes to the um, knowledge of the authorities. But another area where we are basically now working on in the area of detection is, for example, with um, postal services from private companies that provide fast parcel services because one emerging phenomenon is, for example, the trafficking of parts and components via parcel services. And um, many forget that there is an important actor that is, these are these companies, the private companies that can have a role also in facilitating and in helping the detection. Similarly, the transportation companies, we can appeal to responsible trade, responsible um, transport. So there is a role for the for the private sector to play. And I think it has not been fully exploited. Thank you. Thank you. Any other um, comments or, or uh, I think Pierre. Um, thank you, Bruce. Uh, just to compliment what Simonetta said, I think um, it, it is something that we have to definitely start working more in terms of international organizations. Of course, it is quite difficult for us to reach the private sector if there is not a will from the private sector to cooperate with international organizations. We are political bodies, so uh, our member states are governments in itself. So I think we really, really need to build those bridges probably through civil society um, and the public sector so we can reach to the private sector. But in terms of uh, the question, I just wanted to highlight that the last uh, conference of the CIFTA state parties, the fifth conference that it was held in October last year, the recommendations from that conference, uh, there is a specific mandate to encourage international and regional organizations to work together with civil society, the private set sector and the gun industry um, to uh, promote compliance with CIFTA and reduce the issue of uh, illicit firearms trafficking. So I think it is something that is becoming uh, a little bit more visible and that's starting to show in the recommendations and the mandates as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Harrison Lo Lo Lopez has a question for Sheridan. Uh, what can US law enforcement agencies um, such as Homeland Security, ATF, do more of to combat firearms trafficking in the Caribbean, particularly these agencies, liaison or foreign offices? Well, I think that they're doing quite a bit. They're, they're, they're doing a lot. Um, it's, it's, extremely, it's extremely difficult um, to see what, what more they can do. But what, what, I, what I, I, would, I would want to mention, not to, not to go off the point, is connected to that, we, we in the Caribbean, um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the characteristics of, of all countries in the Caribbean, we, we face a, a number of challenges. So I just hope that the, 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 the assistance, and which is where CARICOM Impact's roadmap comes in, it's not a one size fit, fit all. What works in Sao Paulo and what's work, what works in, 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 in San Pedro and so on may not necessarily work in St. Kitts, it may not necessarily work in, in, in Port of Spain. So once we take those, those factors into consideration, I think we, if, if the US, US um, law enforcement agencies uh, genuinely work close with us, and I think that most of them are, I understand the, the domestic political um, interests within the US, um, but I think we just have to continue at it. We also have to, going on the, the last point about the NGOs and so on, community engagement, I think is, is important. Educating all sectors of society about, about the, you know, the, the, the implications of, of illicit trafficking is important. Um, that's basically what I can say for now. So what, what about some comments or that SIFTA, the consultative committee should have more power? Um, instead of just recommending, they should be able to monitor and take action if states don't cooperate um, with the requirements. Um, and, and should there also be a dispute resolution procedure so that states can also bring, um, can, can, can take up matters 
for the consultative committee. And if uh, the other states don't comply, there can be some kind of a dispute resolution procedure. What, what, what do you all think about that? Well, I, I guess I will start um, answering about SIFTA. Uh, there is the broader issue of international law and enforcement of international law. So of course, uh, countries are sovereign uh, and it is quite complicated for an international organization to establish any sort of punishment. We have all the discussion and then Simonita maybe can talk more at the UN level, even with bodies as a security council ha that has way more power than the consultative committee of CIFTA. And there is a still issues of countries, what countries can do. Essentially, any sort of enforcement will always come from countries imposing sanctions us at the OAS level, it's way complicated. It wouldn't be feasible to do that. And the convention doesn't have that mechanism. So it's not a problem all, only of the consultative committee. There is no official mechanism on the convention to punish countries that don't comply. Even though it is legally binding, um, there is no um, established punishment for countries not complying. Uh, the consultative committee does not only make recommendations. It, it is, the idea it is to be a space where the countries can evaluate how they are uh, complying with the convention, what should be done, raise awareness. But unfortunately, there is no mechanism to enforce it. Okay, and and I noticed that Alejandro in the chat has said that um, other governments. Um, in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, can present amicus briefs um, <laughs> in the case that um, the, his ministry has brought. So I imagine that interested governments can contact, contact Alejandro or even um, I know uh, Guillaume um, Michel Blin at the Mexican embassy here in Washington um, can also um, take um, information with respect to interest in amicus briefs. You, you want to say anything more about that, Alejandro? Um, thank you. Yeah, the, the question was if other countries could join our lawsuit um, because of the characteristics are very particular in, in our legal theory, um, more than having co-plaintiffs or thinking that other countries could sue we're asking if people are interested to join us through Amicus, because it is important to highlight the necessity that courts bring these corporations into um, accountability. That's the, the, the whole idea. Thank you. Okay, uh, and I think we're out of time now. So I wanna thank all the panelists for their excellent presentations, for all their preparation, and also for the um, ABA criminal justice section um, especially Kristen Smith and also the uh, Caribbean Policy Consortium in helping to um, organize and um, present this webinar. It has been recorded, so I believe that Kristen Smith will tell you um, what you can do if you want a recording or, and or a copy of the uh, PowerPoint presentations. Kristen? Yes, thank you. Um, and just to, to clarify that, I will look into the possibility of sharing the presentations. I don't want to put the panelists on the spot um, right now, so I'll just double check. But okay. uh, as we noted, the, the, the um, webinar has been recorded, so that would be another way to review the content in the future. Um, and our webinars are typically posted to the Criminal Justice Section's YouTube channel. It uh, just takes a couple days, so um, check, check back on that, or you can reach out to me um, specifically for the link in the future. So uh, thank you again so much to the panelists um, and to our audience for your participation today. Obviously, this is a, a topic that garnered a lot of interest. So that was really great to see. Um, please join the criminal justice section in May for an upcoming non-CLE webinar um, called the Who We Are Project, the truth about the role of anti-Black racism in U.S. policing. And then we also have several upcoming institutes on gaming, healthcare fraud, and white collar crime. You can find out more information about uh, this, those events and other webinars on the CJS events webpage. And please also consider becoming a CJS member um, so you can help us organize more wonderful programs like this one. Um, and again, information is on the CJS webpage for that as well. So again, thank you so much everyone for joining um, and especially to our panelists and moderator.
and have a great day. Okay. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.